Why is Israel, the land that we call Israel, why is that one spot of land so important? I believe that is the original location of the garden. I believe Eden was a geographic location within which eastward the, the Garden of Eden was placed. The Garden of Eden, I believe, is the land that we call Israel. And Abraham was being led back to the garden. Uh, you can follow. There are different maps that you see online that show the journey that uh, Abram took. This is one such map right there. You see that they stop in Shechem. Uh, as confirmation, I believe, when I started to think about the idea that Israel, the land of Israel, is Yahuwah's land. It's not the land of the Jews. It's not the land of the 12 tribes. It's the land of Yahuwah. It's his land. How many times did he say, look, I got house rules. <laughs> you want to live on my land? This is what you got to do. How many of you live in an apartment before? <laughs> You remember the big long pile of paper you had to sign, you know, the, the, the lease agreement? And what happens if you violate the lease agreement? <laughs> you get vomited out. <laughs> well, that's what happens, to, you know, if you want to live on his land and you don't do things his way, you get vomited out. But I believe it's his land, it's his garden. And as I started to think about the idea, was there confirming witnesses? Is there anything I can find in Scripture beyond you know, Rob's speculation that might associate the land of Israel with the Garden of Eden? And you'd see stuff like in Ezekiel 36, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of the countries and will bring you into your own land. Verse 27, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God continues, skipping all the way down to verse 35, just for the sake of time, that land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. So already the land that he's promising them to go back to is being likened unto the Garden of Eden. We see also in Isaiah 51.3, for Yahuwah shall comfort Zion, and it says he'll make their wilderness like Eden and their desert like the Garden of the Lord. Hmm. We see uh, also in Joel, Joel chapter 2, blow ye the trumpet of Zion and, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain and let the inhabitants of the land tremble. And it says down in verse 3, the land is as the garden of Eden before them. So you see a lot of times when people look at the land that was promised to Abraham, you know, from the various rivers and stuff like that, you might see charts like this, that this is the actual plot of land that's promised to the Israelites. Um, I think that's uh, taking a little bit of liberty, that, that particular graphic. I tend to subscribe more to this one right here. Because if this one was true, then they were already in the promised land when they were wandering in the wilderness. This one right here draws the line more from pretty much the, the uh, I believe that we, what we now call the Nile River was the Gihon of the Garden of Eden. And so from Gihon to Euphrates, and if you could just kind of go straight across right there, I believe that's probably more, again, I'm not going to die on this hill, just my speculation, but I think that that's probably more the promised land. It's actually not the little sliver that's over there right now, about the size of New Jersey, uh, uh, but that much bigger land, because that way, that leaves room for them to wander in the wilderness before going into the promised land. Just my thought. How many of you guys have heard of this new thing that's on the drawing boards right now called Neom? Neom. I think it's N-E-O-M. Wow, if you haven't heard of it, Google it, Neom. The uh, Saudis are, are planning this mega city actually right down pretty much in the lower part of the region underneath the, this line right here. So, I mean, they're trying to create a mega city that's going to be like 33 times the size of New York City at a cost of something like $600 billion um, that will make Dubai. How many of you have seen what they did to Dubai? You know, this, this you know, mega pop, uh, futuristic type city. Uh, and apparently it's in the works right now. And if you look into that, that started to confirm a few things in my mind because I'm of the position that the Babylon that's talked about in the last days is the same Babylon that's talked about in, again, declaring the end from the beginning. When I was in the pre-trib dispensation rapture camp, you know, when you're in the pre-trib camp, every day, every sign is we're getting out here tomorrow, right? Uh, you know, it's like, and so you're trying to fit everything that you see into that paradigm. So since Babylon, Iraq is not really happening right now, well, the, New York is Babylon, right? Oh, 9-11, see, the towers came down, the merchants wailed, and see, prophecy, get, we're getting out of here. Start practicing your rapture jump, you know, get the head start. See, you know, when you're in that paradigm, you start trying to force things into the scripture that don't fit there. I believe when it's talking about geographic locations, it means geographic locations that would be familiar to the people in the Bible that we should be looking at. So consequently, you know, I was not popular in that camp when I was in that camp because all of them want to preach that tomorrow's the end of the world. And I'm going, nah, I don't think so. I think the real Babylon, hence the title of my first book, Babylon Rising, 
is going to rise, uh, just as scripture says, in the same reason as the original Babylon. And that's where the idea of the Yahuwah Triangle came to my mind, is it seemed to me the entire Bible really kind of ping-pongs between Egypt, Israel, and Babylon. And there's always stuff going on there, and there's a pattern that I believe that the Father had shown me back in 2009 that I elaborated on in a teaching in 2014. So and if that paradigm is true, then the real Babylon needs to rise again, which looking at current situation was going to take some time, and nobody wanted to hear that. I'm going, well, I, I see at least 20 more years because I see things that need to happen. I'm not saying those 20 years are going to be pleasant. It could be even more than that. You know, it's going to get difficult, I think. But when I saw this neon thing going and what their plans are, First of all, that's going to take a little bit of time to build, and then it's going to take time to become a popular hot zone and to the point where that is the hot spot that everybody loves that place, such that when God finally destroys it, the whole world wails and mourns because of it. You can look at these ancient hills and see nothing. Or you can see nothing to hold you back. No set ways of thinking, no restrictions, no divisions, no excuses. Just endless potential. This is the blank page you need to write humanity's next chapter, Neon. Over 25,000 square kilometers of inspiration, with room for your biggest ideas. A part of the world set aside for those who want to change the world. A land created to free people from stress. A place where pioneers and thinkers and doers can exchange ideas and get things done. A startup the size of a country that will change the way we live and work forever. Healthier, happier, with more time for the things that really matter. A truly global culture from every place and background you can imagine that can show the rest of the planet how it's done with energy that flows from the sun and wind, neighborhoods that can feed and clean themselves, technologies that make life everything it can be. This is where we can prepare together for the next era of human progress. Some will look at these ancient hills and see nothing, but the rest of the world will know that this is where a new way of living began. Discover Neom. On October 24th, Prince Mohammed bin Salman announced the megacity Neom. The name Neom means new future and comes from two words and two languages. First is the Greek word Neo, meaning new, and then the M stands for the Arabic word Mustaqbal, meaning future. It will operate as an independent economic zone with its own laws, taxes, and regulations. Neom will be massive, over 10,000 square miles or over 26,000 square kilometers, and that will make it more than 33 times larger than New York City and a little less than the size of Massachusetts. Located in the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia, Neom loosely connects the three continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe and hopes to be a leading global hub. And in that location, 70% of the world's population will be able to reach it in under eight hours. Neom will strive to be one of the world's economic and scientific capitals. Neom plans to attract the top talent from around the world and push the boundaries of innovation like never before. And they hope to do this by being the safest, most efficient, most future-oriented, and best place to live and work. As Neom is developed and after it's established, it will focus on nine investment sectors and living conditions. They'll focus on energy and water, mobility, biotech, food, technological and digital sciences, advanced manufacturing, media, entertainment, and livability. By investing in the latest innovation in these nine areas, Neom will be a technological proving ground. Also, since Neom will be built from scratch, it will be unlike any other city on Earth, being built with future technologies at the cornerstone of its development. Every aspect will be innovative and futuristic compared to other cities that have evolved over the years. Neom's layout will encourage walking and bicycling, and the city will be solely powered by renewable energy. On top of that, Neom will include disruptive transportation technology, such as self-driving cars, 
passenger drones, and Hyperloop systems. The Russian company Suma Group has announced its support for Neom and plans to invest billions of dollars in a food hub and Hyperloop system for the megacity. Neom will also have utopian features such as free high-speed internet, which they'll call digital air, and it'll also have free world-class continuous online education. Additionally, all of Neom's services and processes will be 100% fully automated. If everything goes according to its vision, Neom will be a glimpse of what's to come in the future. We will see how people will live and how they'll work when robots take most of the jobs because in Neom, all repetitive and arduous tasks will be fully automated and handled by robots, which may outnumber the humans in the city. So I am very interested to see how Neom plays out and I hope it has a positive impact on humanity at large. Seeing this thing with Neom to me is confirming that is the real big sign in terms of Babylon. There's other things going on in Israel that others have talked about here that are big signs we should be paying attention to as well. That's just my opinion on that. Getting back to Shechem. Why Shechem? Well, let's look at a few things. Shechem was the first plot of land within Canaan owned by the house of Abraham. When they got in there, they, th that was the first plot of land that they purchased. That's where Dinah was raped by Shechem, the man for whom the city was named. Simeon and Levi took vengeance and killed him for it, Genesis 34. After Joseph has his dream concerning the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him, his brothers became angry. They leave to go tend their father's flock in Shechem. Jacob slash Israel later sends his beloved son Joseph to find them in Genesis 37. The word Shechem means diligence or early rising. While, his, while looking for his brothers in the place of early rising, he meets a certain man. I've always been intrigued by this. It says he meets a certain man who tells him that they, his brothers, have departed for Dothan. The name Dothan means their double sickness. The English word diligence means the attention and care legally expected or required of a person as a party to a contract. So they left their place of carefully tending to their father's flock to go to the place of double sickness in order to lay in wait for the brother whom they plotted to kill. Pretty wild. After the exodus and the 40 days wandering in the wilderness, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan and were told to go to Shechem, build an altar on Mount Ebal, divide the tribes in half with one part on Mount Gerizim to uh, pronounce the blessings of the Torah and the other on Mount Ebal to pronounce the curses in Deuteronomy 11, 29 and 27, 1 through 29, 1. It was a city of refuge within the promised land, Joshua 21, 21. Joshua gathered all the tribes and elders of Israel and made a covenant with the people at Shechem, Joshua 24, 25. The bones of Joseph, which were brought up from Egypt, were buried in Shechem, and the place became the inheritance of the children of Joseph, Joshua 24, 32. The conversation between Yeshua that he had with the uh, Samaritan woman at the well took place at a place believed to have been a suburb of Shechem in John 4, 3 through 42. And then I saw this interesting passage in Hosea 6 that likens uh, Adam to breaking the covenant on the road to Shechem. So I just began to speculate, going, well, maybe there's something there. And then I saw that Yahuwah had split Shechem. Psalm 60, verse 6, God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkoth. Also in Psalm 108, 7. So if you look on Google Earth, you see what looks like a, uh, was originally one mountain range starting here and going all the way down there. The, it looks like this part was just kind of scooped out and thrown away or something right there. And you have this amazing amphitheater such that even if you go there today, it's, it's of course built up. There's, you know, modern architecture and stuff there. But you can imagine back in biblical times when they went there, it would have been a, a natural amphitheater. So when you had, you know, a few million Jews, or in, not just Jews, Israel, I got to get that out of my head, right? We, uh, all of Israel were gathered together there, split half on Ebal and half on Gerizim, and Joshua was standing there in the middle. Everybody could hear each other. It was a perfect amphitheater. Um, and as I was speculating on all of this, I happened to walk by uh, in the kitchen where Sheila was uh, washing some dishes or something, and she was listening to Jim Staley's Torah por portion. I think it was on Re'eh, the Torah portion. And he began to speculate and give reasons for why he believed this, but he believed that Shechem was the place where God cut the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. And you know the story. You know, Abraham's put to sleep and the animal pieces are parted and you know, God walks through them and all that. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 27, it says this, Then Moshe, Moses, and the elders of Israel charged the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. So here it is. So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan into the land which the Lord God gives you that day that you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime. 
and write on them all the words of this law, okay, and that word law is Torah, okay? Write on the words of this law, the Torah, which means instructions, when you cross over so that you may enter the land which the Lord God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God your fathers promised you. So it shall be when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up on Mount Ebal these stones as I'm commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, right there in the center is the city of ancient Shechem. Okay? This is a narrow passageway. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you the story. What Yahweh said is He said, I want you to go in, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant, I want you to take half the tribes, and I want you to stand on half of them on Mount Gerizim, and I want you to take the other half of the tribes, and I want you to stand on Mount Ebal. He says, I want you to proclaim the blessings. While I'm proclaiming the blessings, I want you, everyone to look to Mount Gerizim, and when you proclaim the curses, I want everyone to look at Mount Ebal. Right in the middle between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim is a natural amphitheater. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's a natural amphitheater. It's a natural like valley. It's kind of off in the distance where the horizon is there. And that's where they stood, right in the valley so everybody could hear, all, all however many there were. A couple of million people. This is Joshua's altar. This was a spectacular, gorgeous altar. Right here between these two mountains is a derrick at Shechem where God's people were there. And on one side was the blessings, one side was the curses. He's using visuals to get his point across. Joshua builds, a, builds an altar, uses natural stones. The limestone is put around it for a reason because limestone is malleable. Ma limestone you can write on. It, 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 you understand what I'm saying? It's a soft stone. You can only write on something that's soft. And he wants to write it on a heart of flesh, vellum limestone. And he says, I want my Torah to be written on your heart. They departed and they went to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, the same exact route as the Israelites are at right now. Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, I just showed you that, as far as the Teremith tree of Moray. There it is. So this is the very first, excuse me, very first time that we have someone stopping at the tree of Moray. What happens? The Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to Yahweh who had appeared to him. Are you kidding me? This is 400 years, ladies and gentlemen, before Joshua shows up with the Israelites in this exact same place. Now see, we don't live in the land, so we don't make these connections. But Abraham, that what, 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 what was the covenant made from? What happened that day? Did he give him a can of Pepsi and say, drink, let's pray, you know. Phew. What's that? No? What, what happened that day? Something was cut in two. An animal was cut in two, remember? And two halves, and what happened? Abraham was put to sleep. And he went through the middle, did he not? Right here, ladies and gentlemen. There's a reason that Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are standing the way that they are. Because they are standing as a witness. 400 years later, the altar that Abraham made and the picture. Why do you think that he had half the tribes go on one side and half the tribes go on the other? And the tabernacle, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant is right dead center in between. Because this is the exact place where Yahweh walked between the two halves. You know, it makes me think, you know, did he walk, <laughs> did he do like a little figure eight right there or something and kind of walk through animal parts and carve that, you know, enter from one side, do his thing and walk out the other side, leaving that? I don't know, it's pure speculation. Uh, but let's continue. Deuteronomy 11. 26, uh, beginning of verse 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of Yehoah your God, 
which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of Jehovah your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when Jehovah thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan by the way where the sun goeth down in the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in the campaign over against Gilgal, besides the plains of Moray? For ye shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. Deuteronomy 30, beginning in verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love Yahuwah thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the strength of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which Yahuwah swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. That reminded me of another scripture says, hey, I've got two trees I set before you, life and death. <laughs> choose life. You choose poorly, Daniel son. <laughs> they chose poorly uh, originally in the garden. So if the land of Israel, the land that we call Israel, is in fact the garden, it is my opinion that the land we call Shechem within the land of Israel is ground zero in the garden. That it's the location of the two trees. That the it became my firm belief that Abraham was led out of sin to Shechem and that Yahuwah made his covenant of promise there in Genesis 15 and that the Israelites, upon entering the land, had to first stop there, write out the commandments and pronounce the blessings and the curses because it is my opinion that's ground zero in the Garden of Eden. The reason they pronounced the blessings on Mount Gerizim is because it's my belief that's where the Tree of Life was. Somebody was asking me about the Tree of Life last night. Uh, I believe that's the location of Ger Gerizim and Ebal was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's why they are commanded to write the, the curses there. They have to build an altar there. It's basically, hey, stupid, remember, the, remember last time you were here? Don't choose poorly. You know, I got a choice. Life, death. Here, here's a hint. Choose life. Just an opinion, but I think that's where fellowship was originally broken and that's where he's constantly trying to get his people back to reunite that fellowship with them. So you see it happen with Abraham, you see it happen with the Israelites. There's so many things that kept leading me and my research back to Shechem uh, to the point where I can't wait for my Messiah to come back and usher me back there himself to have that fellowship in the garden again. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.